Good morning. What an absolutely beautiful day to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? Aren't you grateful for the pleasant temperatures and the sunshine and the springtime of year and new beginnings? And yeah, that's exciting. And uh, as I look around here today, um, yeah, I, I could see most of you before the lights came on. Most of you are here because you want to be. There are few of you who may be here for other reasons, but I hope before you leave today, you'll be saying, I'm glad that I did come today. Thank you for being on this journey with us as we're reading through the Bible together, the chronological order of the Bible. Every day we have set aside designated readings that we're reading together. We're providing you with a daily podcast to supplement something that you would have read that particular Day, and then we've provided journals for you to write and what the Lord's speaking to you. Uh, and we have a website dedicated exclusively to that. It's onesinglestory.com. If you need a list of the daily readings, you can find them there. If you want to see the podcast or go back and catch one that you missed, you'll be able to do it there. And every week, we are preaching a message out of something that you would have read this week. So, really, you have a, a fairly good idea of where we're going to be each week if you're keeping up with the readings. And as we go through the message, I hope that it speaks to you. And perhaps you see or hear something that you didn't see or hear when you read through. And by the way, that happens to me every time I read the Bible. I can read the same passage five different times, teach it or preach it on five different occasions. And every time I see and hear something in there that I've never seen or heard before. That's because the Word of God is alive and it's real and it's applicable to who we are and where we are. Today's message I've entitled, Traps to Holiness. And by that I mean impediments, things that keep us from going on our spiritual journey and walk and becoming closer to God and becoming more like His Son, Jesus, there are a lot of things in our world, in our society, that can be traps for us. Think with me on a practical level. And, and this list could be exhausted, I mean, just continuously on. But some of the biggest we think about, money is a trap for a lot of people. In a lot of different ways. For some people, it causes them to compromise their integrity and their standards. For some people, it allures them to work so much to the abandonment of time with their family. I didn't get no support on that one. And, and the list goes on there as it relates to money. Relationships can be a trap to us in our walk with God if we're not careful. Power, influence, politics can be a real big trap to us if we're not careful. Do you understand that even religion can be a trap to us and get in the way of our walk and our relationship with God? Familiarity and complacency and tolerance can become big, big traps for us and we don't even realize it until we're so far in the trap that we can't get out of it. Society today, with all of its advertising and marketing, does a splendid job of Luring us in, trapping us into making decisions oftentimes that aren't good for us, aren't healthy for us, or that we just simply can't afford. This past week, my wife and I happened to be over to Elizabeth City, and I, I said to her, I, I have a watch here, the battery's dead, and I, I want to stop by this jewelry store and go in and get a battery for my watch. I said, and that's all. And I looked over at her and I said, I'll be right back. She said, I'm going in. I thought, oh. So we went in and listen, you go in a jewelry store. The next time you go in one, even if it's just get a watch battery, I want you to notice how they have the layout of the cabinets there with the clear glass that has no smudges on it. And the most expensive stuff in there will have a background to it. It's usually dark. It may be purple or black or, or dark blue or something. So that the special lighting in there makes the stuff in there just spark. It looks like it's alive. And the next thing you know, you're going, ooh. Oh. 
And so I'm, I'm dealing with lady about getting a battery in my watch, and she takes it, and she's going to fix it right there on the scene. And so I'm so happy and excited. And, and just a matter of a couple minutes, it seems like, went by. I turn around and look, and the other sales attendant in there had my wife over by a case, and the case was open, and she was trying on jewelry. I said, run, it's a trap. <laughs> I couldn't get out of there fast enough. She couldn't stay long enough. And yes, we only got the watch battery case. You're wondering. So let's look at the passage today and discover some of the traps that if we're going to move forward in our walk and our relationship with God and be all that he wants us to be, there are some things that we need to do and some things we need to stop doing. Now, some of these messages, including the one today, we, we look at them and we preach them, understanding that some people are going to misunderstand and to say, listen, I've got a relationship with God. My sins are under the blood of Jesus. Don't tell me anything else about how to live because it's none of your business. It's not my business, but it's God's business. And if you are a child of God, then you belong to him rather than yourself. And so these instructions are valuable for all of us. Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. It says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, you are about to enter and to occupy. Notice the, the, the passage is set up here by this introduction that when you get to where I want you to be. Notice. That's future, and it's what I want for you. He's going to lay out, once you get to where I want you to be, there are going to be some unique challenges in your life that if you're not careful, are going to trap you and derail you from your walk with God. Notice he said, the land that you're about to, one, enter. Secondly, occupy. When you enter in, that's first level. A lot of people, quote, enter into a relationship with Jesus, into a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit, but they don't stay there. Notice he, he denotes the difference here when you enter and when you occupy. One is temporary, one is permanent. He says, when you do this, he will clear away many nations ahead of you. And he lists seven different categories or groups of people here. Then he goes on. These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you, which is simply stating the facts. He said, there's a place I want you to be. When you get there, I want you not only to enter it, I want you to stay there permanently. And by the way, even when you get there, there are going to be some obstacles in your life. And they are literally more numerous than you. They are bigger than you. They are stronger than you. They are better equipped than you. He said, but I've got a plan and a purpose. I think oftentimes in our Christian walk, we have this misconception that when I come to Christ and when I walk with him long enough and I do enough right things, I tithe, I tend on a regular basis, I pray for the people on the mission field and I try to do some good deeds, that everything in my life is going to work out exactly how I want it to work out. Can I tell you, that's a myth. Some of you are saying, well, that's the worst news I've heard this week. Listen, the difference is when you are where God wants you to be and you face these things, he's going to come alongside of you and make a way of deliverance for you. I'd rather be in the place God wants me to be facing opposition than to be not where he wants me to be and not have any. Let's read on. He says in verse 2, when the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and, notice, you conquer them. 
It's another part of the great misconception. When I come to Christ, everything's going to fall into place. All of my bad habits, all the things that I've struggled with in the past are going to be gone. Listen, sometimes God miraculously and graciously does that. I've heard numerous, numerous testimonies. But can I tell you, most often it is you make a choice and decision to follow Christ. You go where he's leading you, and then he'll give you instructions how to overcome the enemy you're facing. Do you notice here in this passage, he said, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to deliver and give you this territory. You're going to conquer these people. But there is responsibility on your part to do what you're supposed to do. Salvation is not earned. I want to make that crystal clear. There's nothing we can do to earn the merited favor of God. It's by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But becoming a believer takes on a great deal of responsibility and accountability. And many of the hardships and struggles that you and I face in this life as believers, God has given us the instructions and the opportunity and the resources and the ability to deal with them, but it's up to us. So many examples I could give you there, but let's move on in the interest of time. He says, I'm going to hand them over, but you have to conquer them or defeat them. You must, notice, completely destroy them. This is one of the, the, the most important. There's several great points in this message today. Here's one, of the, one I think is the most profound that you need to get a hold of right at the beginning of this passage is the things that God has identified, and that include people, places, things, that God has identified as off limits to you, you need to eliminate them. For the rest of you, other than those three, I'm going to say it again. When you are being led by the Spirit of God and you are at the place where He wants you to be, there are often times people, places, things, events, circumstances, activities that He will identify to you that you need to eliminate out of your life. Otherwise, they're going to become traps to you in the future. Notice he gets very specific when he said completely destroy them. Make no treaties or no compromise with them. Personal opinion, I think one of the reasons that the church is as weak spiritually and influentially weak in, in the world in which we live is, is because we have bought into this politically correct mentality that we've got to keep everybody happy at the risk of offending anybody. Now listen, it is never my intent and it should never be your intent to intentionally offend or hurt people. Did you hear me? But there's a time when you have to stand and say, no, that's not right based on the authority of the Word of God, and I'm not going to compromise on it. Amen. Whomever it is, and whatever the issue is. He says, so make no treaties, make no compromises with them, show them no mercy. In other words, stop feeling sorry for them if they choose not to believe and follow God. I've had some recent opportunities to counsel and coach with some people in some really, really difficult places. And after you talk with them a little while, they understand fully what they need to do, but they choose not to do it. Stop blaming God for your problems when you're not doing your part. I got to move on. So don't compromise. Don't feel sorry for them. He said, You must not intermarry with them, meaning don't partner with them. This could be in business, it could be in a marriage relationship, literally, it could be in a religious organization. And you can extrapolate that list out a long ways. He said, but don't partner up with people who aren't following me. Notice he says, 
Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me. One of the greatest sense of responsibilities that I have, not only for the way I live, but it's the way that I live and the choices and decisions that I make because I know I'm influencing, I'm influencing everybody who sits in one of these chairs and I'm influencing my own grown children and my grandchildren behind me. And the standards that I lower and accept now, they will take to excess. So if you are not going to be disciplined enough to do what you know is right based on the instructions of the Word of God for crying out loud, do it for the people who are looking at you. Oh, God, I'm I'm in dangerous territory now. I'm going to be as generic as I can because I I do not mean this person. Listen, when I preach, I don't pick out anybody. The Holy Spirit speaks. He gives us passage, and we just preach it. Listen, if the things of God, including the house of God, is not a primary focus and importance to you, don't expect your children or grandchildren to think it is. If you keep all of the resources God has blessed you with and you never volunteer and serve, don't expect the people behind you all of a sudden to say, you know what, I think that's a good idea, I will. Because they're most likely not to, they are watching you. He said that your children will be led away to worship other gods, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and he will quickly destroy You, this is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars. This is anything anti-God. Listen, this message applies to us March the 20th, 2022. Anything that is anti-God in our life needs to come down. That's relationships. That's places we go, activities we engage in, things we watch, things we hear, things we read, things we look at, things we entertain. And the list goes on and on. If it's, if it's anti-God, it needs to be broken down. He said, break down the pagan altars, the place of worship that are anti-God, and shatter their sacred pillars, which were carved images of stone. There are probably some things in our lives that are anti-God that have been around so long or even generationally, it's like they are pillars of stone and we don't even recognize it. And God said, when you get to them and when I point them out to you, he said, you need to break down not only their, their altars, he said, but shatter their stone pillars, which would be anything that is more important than your worship of me. Then he says, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols. Now, Asherah pole was simply, sometimes it could have been an ornamental tree next to a, a place of Worship to a false idol. Could have been a pole that actually was cut from a tree that would have been carved, would have been decorated. The Canaanite goddess Asherah was thought to believe what, what, and I'm going to loosely interpret this, what we would call Mother Earth. She was, quote, supposedly to the Canaanites, the mother of all humanity and all gods. There were at least 70 other little g-gods that came under her that were attributed to her. And this worship was going on. And he said, break down cut down and burn some things. Lest you think I'm preaching to you, I'm not. This message has already convicted me. Because see, the problem with getting into a trap that we'll talk a little bit more in just a moment is 
so often it is a subtle progression until you're there and you can't get out. If the devil showed up here today and he came in and he said, uh, by the way, I want you to, when you leave here, I want you to go to rob the store or I want you to go stab somebody or I want you to go commit adultery. You'd be like, you're crazy, get out of here. But see, traps are designed so that you get there slowly but surely and systematically until you are the prey. Let's read on. He says, for you are a holy people. That passage still applies to us. If you are a believer, if you've confessed Christ as your Savior and asked for forgiveness of your sins, do you understand that you are now part of a holy group of people? We might not act like it sometimes. No, I'm going to change that. We might not act like it most of the time. But we are considered his holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. I understand this passage was being addressed to the nation of Israel, but it still has the same implication for us today out of all the people on the planet right now. Think about it. Of all the billions of people on the planet right now, the fact that you have been introduced to Jesus, have made a choice and decision to follow him, that the Lord has chosen you to be his own special treasure from all the people on the earth right now. I don't, we, we don't get it. We don't get it. Because if you realize how significantly special you are to be chosen to be a part of the family of God, it would change every aspect of your life and how you view life. Oh, there's so many places I could go back. I got so much to get in. I, let me get back here. Look at verse 7. He said, the Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you, which he has, because you were more numerous than other nations. For you were the smallest of all the nations. Here it is, this beautiful verse 8. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. You want to know why you're here today? You want to know why you're a part of the family of God? You want to know why your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus and and you're on your way to heaven, your best life is, is ahead of you? Right here's the answer. It's simply that the Lord loves you. Isn't that great news? That's not good news. That's great news. And he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with a strong arm from slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He says, understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commandments. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. See, you can't just have always have love and grace and mercy without occasionally talking about the justice and righteousness of God. It has to be balanced. He says, therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations I'm giving you today, verse 12. If you listen, that is different than hearing. If you listen... If you listen with the intent to understand and then obey. If you are married, at some point in time, and it probably happened this week, where one of the two of you said to the other one, you're not listening to me. Don't a dog is hell. <laughs> is she in the back? Okay, he's safe. <laughs> there is a difference in hearing something and listening to understand. He says, if you listen to these regulations and notice, faithfully obey them. That's consistently. That's purposefully. That's every chance you get. doesn't mean you're going to be perfect because we're not. 
He said, but that's in your heart, and, and, and you consistently seek to obey what I'm asking you to do. He says, the Lord your God will keep this covenant of unfailing love with you as he promised with an oath to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you, and he will give you many children, or literally a legacy that's passed on. I stand here before you today because of godly Christian parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. Now, none of them had the ability to save me. I had to make my own choice and decision to follow Jesus. But the godly influence that I saw passed down through those generations made it so easy for me to be introduced to him. And he says, I'll give you a legacy. He will give fertility to your land and to your animals. Do you understand that there is a direct correlation to you getting what you need materially speaking in this life is directly related to how much you love and pursue God? Mm. Don't you misunderstand me, and I'm, so I'm going to say it this way. I am in no way saying if you want to be wealthy and rich, follow God. That's not what I'm saying at all. Not at all. What I just said was... If you want to make sure that you have all the necessary provisions for your day-to-day -day life, it is directly related to how you pursue your relationship with God. Because he said he would not forsake or abandon his own. And here he said he'll give fertility to your land and to your animals. And when you arrive in the land, he swore to give your ancestors. You will have large harvest of grain, new wine, olive oil, great herds of cattle, sheep and goats. You will be blessed above all the nations of the earth. None of your men or women or literally couples will be childless and all your livestock will bear young and the Lord will protect you from what? what but what, what's the word before the sickness? He said will protect you from all the sickness. He will not let you suffer from the terrible diseases that you knew in Egypt. See they experience a lot of things physically, relationally, mentally, spiritually, financially deficits pestilence, the plagues that invaded the land. God said, all I want to do is have a close relationship with you. He said, and by the way, he said, if you'll do that as a nation, he said, I'll make sure that none of those things you experienced back in Egypt that you'll have to deal with moving forward. Verse 16. Here it is again, the re-emphasis. You must destroy all the nations the Lord your God hands over to you show them no mercy and do not worship their gods or they will what they will trap you i want you to note that traps are target specific everybody knows what this is what is it it's a mouse trap. It, it's not a bear trap. It's not a coyote trap. It is a mouse trap. Some of these larger traps could trap a fox or coyote or a mole or a beaver and a possum or a raccoon or a squirrel or whatever would fit in there. But I want you to note that every one of these are designed specifically for a specific species. And let me let you in on a little secret in case you're not aware. The enemy of your soul, the devil, already has specific traps targeted for you. Your trap probably is going to look much different than my trap what I have to be on the lookout for the unique thing about this very small trap is in order to catch the prey they have to rely on the prey's senses sight smell taste touch feel and when you and I start living our lives where we make choices and decisions based on our natural senses, who and what we 
we see, what we smell, what we touch, what we taste, what we desire, I promise you at some point in time, you are going to get in a trap. Because our natural senses will fail us in that they often are at odds with the instructions and directions of God. This happens to be a mole trap. This trap is set and it is most of it, the working parts of it are placed underground, out of sight, because a mole, once he establishes his routine, is going to be oblivious to the disruptions. Listen, you set this trap, you, you, you take your hand or a stick and mash down a spot there in that dirt. So when he gets there, he says, mm, 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 I'm going to push this out of the way. And all of a sudden, next thing he knows, he's history. The next time you are tempted... To say, oh, why is that in my way? Before you proceed, you better pay attention. Because there may be a trap lurking close by. This is called a leg hold trap. None of these are set, by the way. It, well, except I think that one is. So don't fear for me. But it's called a leg hold trap because, listen, it is designed to capture something and hold it by the leg until somebody or something else comes and takes complete control of it. And this trap is most effective when it's put in a place where something spends too much time in a place. And they get careless. Some of these traps are put out in, in, in broad daylight in the wide open and some of them are concealed. This one works best when it's set and it's concealed by sifting some dirt around it. And then when the unsuspecting animal comes along and spends too much time in that place. He can fall prey to it. This contraption here, many of you may not be familiar with it. It's called a conibear trap. It's not said. I dare not set it because it, it is, of all these, it, it is extremely powerful, designed to take down larger animals. But listen, this trap is set out usually in the wide open and staked down once it's set and put on a pathway that an animal traverses back and forth where he is so familiar with that he no longer pays attention to his surroundings. He's been there and done that so many times, he is oblivious to what's going on. And he walks head first into it. This thing collapses immediately and it is over with lights out. And sometimes we wonder how we get headlong into the enemy's trap in some areas of our life. When oftentimes the simple answer is we've become so familiarized and so oblivious, so accustomed to the routine of our life, including our spiritual walk with God, that we're oblivious to what the enemy's doing around us until it's too late. I'll share one more with you, and we've got to get back. This one you're probably most familiar with, the, the cage or the live trap. And I know what some of you are thinking. Listen, I can understand all of these at some point in time making a mistake and getting caught in it, but I am way too smart for that one because it's sitting out in the broad daylight, wide open. Everybody knows what it is. But you know what? I think this is the one we get in most often. You know why? 
because of the bait and the stuff that is put on the inside of it becomes so tantalizing to us And we know we shouldn't be over there. We know that is dangerous territory. We know we shouldn't return that text. We know we shouldn't make that phone call. We know we shouldn't make that business deal. We know we ought to be in the house of God instead of being somewhere else. And the list can go on and on. But eventually, we become so enamored and drawn into what's on the inside, we're willing to take a risk. Think for yourself right now how many times you've you've been in a trap of some kind. And if you'd be honest with yourself, you said, you know what? I, I, I saw the bait. I smelled it. I wanted it. I made a decision. I rationalized. I thought I could get in there and get what I wanted and get out unscathed. Do you know one of the best ways to live trap an animal that is very leery of this is to, is to put something around this where this won't drop down and just go ahead and feed him two or three, four times and get him used to it and he'll get to the point where he goes in and out of there and don't give it a second thought because he's not paid a price yet. I need to tell somebody here today, you've been in flirting in a trap You have rationalized and justified your actions and your choices. And because you've not been caught yet, I'm telling you, the lid's about to slam behind you. I don't even know who you are. God knows. And he loves you enough to send you a message, a warning. Stay out of the trap. Keep your eyes wide open. Stop spending time in places you shouldn't be. Don't get so comfortable doing life the way you've always done it, including your relationship with God, that you become oblivious to the obvious around you. He said, because traps are lurking everywhere. Verse 17. Perhaps you will think to yourselves, how can we ever conquer these nations that are so much more powerful than we are But don't be afraid of them. Just remember. And I want you to know in in the next two lines here, he's going to mention remember three times. Remember what the Lord your God did. That's past tense. To Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. Second time. Remember the great terrors the Lord your God sent against them. Past tense. You saw it with your own eyes. And third time. Remember the miraculous signs and wonders and the strong hand and powerful arm with which he brought you out of Egypt. Understand he's addressing them when you get to the place I'm leading you. There are going to be all of these opportunities for traps to ensnare you. He's given them a pretty comprehensive list of things they need to do and to avoid and to eliminate. And he's saying now part of your success moving forward in the future to avoid the traps in your life is to constantly remember what I've already done for you. I'm just throwing this out because I'm guilty and and I've been challenged this week. How many times today, how many times this week have you been specific and set aside time where you did nothing except thank God for what he's already done for you? Because here's what I found this week as I practiced that more and more. Is my sensitivity level to the Word of God and the Spirit of God increased? My awareness of, quote, traps around me increased. And he said here, part of the success, if you want to move forward and avoid the traps, is constantly remember where you've come from and what God has already done for you. It says verse 20. And then the Lord your God will send terror, some translations say hornets, notice, to drive out the few survivors still hiding from you. I got to make this point. I'm going to move on. Don't fall into the trap, pun intended, 
of thinking because you've dodged the big thing in your life that there aren't some little ones lurking that you can't see. This passage of scripture says it's the little foxes that spoiled or destroy the vine. Speaking of grape vines. He says, to drive out the few survivors still hiding from you. Always be vigilant. Always be alert. Verse 21. Do not be afraid of these nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and he is a great and awesome God. Isn't that encouraging to know? As you and I face life, deal with life, as there are obstacles and traps set for us all around us, that God is among us and that he is a great and awesome God, the Lord your God will drive those nations out, notice, ahead of you, little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. I've always thought this is a fascinating passage of Scripture here. Let's, let's look at some practical applications and we're almost done. The Lord already said when you get to the place you're going to enter and then you are to occupy. You're to be there permanently. He said, I'm, I'm going to deliver these folks and things in your hands, but you've got to do the work. You've got to obey me and follow me and do what you can do. And then there's some traps that you need to avoid. He said, and by the way, just so you'll know, before you ever get over and before this process ever starts, he said, I'm going to drive out or allow you to drive out those nations little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. Here's what I've discovered through the years. That oftentimes when I have gotten myself into trouble for whatever the reason and I feel trapped, whatever it looks like in my life, that is usually an event. If you step in one of these or put your hand in one of these, one of them closes on you, boom, you know it, don't you? The traps that we get ourselves into usually is an event. But listen, the deliverance is usually a process. I need to remind some people in here right now. You said, I, I've struggled with this issue, this stronghold, this vice, this, this thing that has plagued me. And I, I keep struggling with it. It keeps coming back and back. Listen. If you will obey the Lord and follow his command and avoid the traps that are all around you, some of them are obvious, some of them are hidden. He said, and pursue me. I'm going to deliver you. But like he told the people here, usually, oftentimes, it is little by little. Here's one thing I know from personal experience. When I get a, into a crisis mode, I pray and I'm earnest, I'm sincere, and I want God to deliver me. Boom, right here, right now. Pew, let it be gone. But you know what? I don't learn a lesson through that. We make all kind of promises. God, I won't ever do that again. I won't ever misbehave. I won't ever die. Now I'll do this and I'll serve. I'll do this. If you'll just rescue me and deliver Listen, if he, let, if he let you out of the trap, if he let you go that quick, you'd be forgot him before you got to Bojangles for lunch. Sometimes it is the mercy and grace of God that he delivers us little by little, systematically, so that when we do finally get clear, we're on solid ground. And we're a different person. We're more like Jesus when we get out, when it's a process, than when we got in the trap to begin with. He said, little by little, otherwise the wild animals would multiply too quickly. Listen, wild animals were a good thing. They were a, a source of food. But if all of a sudden God drove out the entire land of, the, of, of Canaan, the geographical region and the people, it was going to be a long time, perhaps even years, because it took them years, to get where they were going and get settled in and, and establish their houses and their towns and all those things. He said the wild animals would have multiplied so much that you'd have had a whole different problem to deal with. I 
see people sometimes, it, we live our life, it's like a ping pong match. One struggle, one problem, one need, boom, God shows up. And we just trade it for another one over here. Boop, let's send it right back over here. Boop. And we live ping pong lives. God said, when you get to where I'm sending you, don't just enter it, but occupy it. There are some things, anything, anti-God, people, places, things, whatever it looks like, he said that you need to eliminate. And you need to pursue me and worship me with all of your heart. He said, because all these other things are distractions and hindrances and they become traps to you. And they, they are designed to hold you, to keep you captive, and to destroy you. You, He said, and, and even when you get in one of those situations and I show up, he said, you got a role to play in this. And little by little, I'm going to lead you out. Because if I did it too soon, you're just going to inherit another problem. Isn't God good in his mercy that he often delivers us little by little so that he changes us in the process? Verse 25. You must burn their idols in fire. You must not covet the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it or it will become a trap to you. For it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do you understand what he's saying to the people? He says, and by the way, when you get in there and you start conquering those people, you start driving them out, and all of a sudden you come across this, this golden or, or silver idol, and you say, you know what? God said that's off limits. I don't need to be a part of that. So I'm going to destroy the idol, the wood, the image inside, but I'm going to keep the gold and silver for myself. If God says it's off limits, it's off limits. All of it. And everything associated with it. Saul, the king of Israel, got in trouble because the Lord had told him to go against the Amalekites and destroy them all. He said, don't let anything survive. When the prophet finally showed up, he heard the sheep and the cattle lowing and all that and the prophet asked he said what is this I hear he said oh by the way he said I made an executive decision we kept the best of everything so we could sacrifice it to God even though he said don't keep any of it see the idol was the obvious primary thing the gold that overlaid it was the secondary thing and as long as you and I keep making excuses for the decisions that we're making and the rationalization of why it's okay. This is your destiny. It's a trap. There's an awful price to be paid. And, and we're closing. Verse 26. Do not bring any detestable objects into your home. He said, or oh, then you'll be destroyed just like them. I've never been, never planned to be a preacher who tells you what to do and what not to do other than within the parameters of the Scripture of the Word of God. But we live in a wicked and evil day. We need the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives and in our homes if we're going to be effective for the kingdom of God. And if we ever hope to accomplish that, we're going to have to make some decisions about things we no longer allow in our lives or in our homes. God said, I'm not going to tolerate it. Listen, everybody else may not know about it. I don't need to know about it. I don't want to know about it. Remember the passage we looked at last week? It said, be sure your sins will find 
you out. And, and like David, my, my sincere prayer and heart's desire, and I hope it is yours too, is to create in me a clean heart. Oh Lord, renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your righteous right hand. Listen, we're saved by the blood of Jesus. The quality of this life and the relationship we have with God rest on our shoulders. Let's pray. Quickly, how many of you, be honest, you say, you know what, I've heard this message, the Holy Spirit has challenged my heart. There are some people, places, some things, some activities, whatever it may look like, but there are some things that the Holy Spirit has already spoken to your heart that you need to eliminate from your life if you're going to move forward and get to where God wants you to be and experience all that he has for you. And you say, with God's help, I want to make those tough decisions, those tough choices today to eliminate those things that are distracting me that are ultimately going to lead me into a trap. If that's your sincere prayer. I want you to raise your hand to God right now. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're not alone, most, every, most everybody in this house. Thank you for your honesty before God. He sees your heart. He's going to honor that. Who in this place will say, you know, I, I feel like I've made a turn in my life. I'm praying more. I'm reading more. Hearing from God more. But I'm not where I want to be yet. And, and I'm not even completely delivered from, from the struggles that I have. And it seems like it's been so slow and systematic. It's been little by little. But I realized today through this message that... God's working to change me so that when I come out, I'm a different person. And I need courage and strength to continue on this journey to find complete freedom, deliverance, and healing and become who God wants me to be. If that's you, raise your hand up real quick. Just slip it up. Yes, thank you. All over this house. Father, I thank you for the truth and the power of your holy word. Thank you for the anointing and the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that is speaking to hearts and lives in this place today. You desire, you have a place for us to enter and to occupy that fits into your plan and purpose. And you said even if we obey and get there, there are going to be traps and distractions and hindrances along the way. And you've put some great challenges before us today, Lord. And many of us have acknowledged that there are people, places, things that we need to eliminate. There's some things we need to break down, cut down, tear down, or burn down. Any anti-God influence in our life needs to be gone so that we can please and honor you and worship you with a pure heart. God, give us the courage, the wisdom, as you identify those areas. Help us to make the disciplined choices and decisions moving forward to eliminate those distractions, those potential traps, so that we can enter the place and occupy the place and experience all the bountiful blessings you have in store for us. Lord, for those who have acknowledged that they are on that journey and you are working in their life, but it's been a slower process than they would like, and at times they're frustrated because the allurements, the enticements still come from time to time, and they're still in a struggle, and they've not got complete victory. Thank you for reminding them that you've not forsaken them or abandoned them. You're delivering them little by little, step by step, so that when they come out of this process, they are a changed man or a changed woman, more in the image of Jesus than they've ever been before. And Lord, we ask that you would help us as we close this passage today, not to allow any detestable anti-God thing in our lives or in our homes, in our hearts, our minds, our ears. But we would be given completely and totally to you for your glory and honor. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.